Good morning. Welcome. This is the regular meeting of the Danville Architectural Heritage Board, Wednesday, December 20th, 2017, 9.32 a.m. A little bit of a late start. I believe we have a quorum. Um, and Bridget, we're not listed on the agenda, but don't we have a special we have minutes from a special call meeting. Do we need to? They were in their packets. Okay. Yes. I'm there. sorry. We've forgotten, left it off the agenda. So, yes, if you okay. would add that in as a okay. topic there to approve. We actually had two minutes from the last meeting and the special <clears throat> call meeting. If uh, we'll go first with the last regular meeting, if anyone's had a chance to review. I'll entertain a motion to approve. I make a motion we approve the minutes. I have a motion to approve. I have a second from Ms. Dana. Any can we, further can we add in the dates to that motion? Uh, oh, I, I move we approve the uh, minutes from November 15th meeting. And November 20th. Oh, and we can do them both. We can do them both. Okay. okay. And the November 20th. Great. Okay. All right. So I have a motion, have a second. Any further discussion or questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. None opposed. Let's move on to our next topic. Um, I just lost my place. Hang on. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> Um, that's I, you? Yes. I just want to introduce to you all our new preservation coordinator that's working with us 15 hours a week, and that is Joni House. She's been with us a month and is doing a wonderful job thus far, so we are hit the ground running. we got a lot of stuff to get done in the new year, so you will hear about some of that. So welcome, Joni. Glad to have you. Uh, third, <laughs> you, have to, you should tell us more about her or something. It's, we need you a You want to say anything, Joni? <laughs> Let me turn on my fancy microphone. <laughs> uh, currently, I work for the Commonwealth, too, as the um, Perryville Park Manager at the Battlefield. Uh, and then this is my part-time job, which I'm going to be real busy for the next year. But uh, I have a background in historic preservation. I hold a master's degree from the University of Kentucky for historic preservation. I'm extremely familiar with a lot of the preservation issues surrounding land conservation, and I'm getting up to speed now with structures and city landscapes, uh, although it's going to probably take me more than a month <laughs> to get where I need to be. I'm pretty comfortable with your grants and working with your grants. I know a lot of you folks, and some of you I don't know. Some of you I've had the pleasure of working with before, but I'm really excited that uh, this is kind of a turn for me, and uh, it's different and interesting, although challenging, I will say, um, but I'm looking forward to it. And again, if you guys need me, give me my cell phone, uh, I'm available to you, so just give me a holler. Great. And Great. I like horses, if that's the personal thing, <laughs> a lot. All right, look forward to speaking more with you. Uh, back on track, number three, our current certificate of appropriateness, 413 West Main Street, and Miss Nancy Davis. Nancy, if you would step up again and tell us you're, you're just redoing all of downtown No, it needs to be recorded, so. Okay. I think that one died. Should I, I'm not going to start over. So uh, I'm here today to ask that a sign be approved for the Tut's restaurant there on 413 and 415 West Main. So uh, since we've expanded into the former uh, Art of Danville location, and um, so we need a bigger sign. And there's still people, we, uh, Tut's Restaurant's been there a year and a half, and there's still people that do not know they're in Danville. I think it's a combination of factors, but a sign's definitely going to help. Uh, and we've got a copy of the sign lettering, and it's going to be in, I think it's either in uh, some silver and some colors we're hoping will show up also at night. For some strange reason, I've asked the city about it. We do not have 
lights down there, like the street lights don't work. And uh, we've, uh, I thought it was just a bulb bad, and when I contacted the city, they said the city had, for some reason, they've got the electrical outlet in the ground, but someone forgot to run the wiring to those lights, if you're wondering why there's no lights down there. So there's, no, there's about three lights that don't work. I don't think the ones working in front of the community arts center either, do they? Right, so there's... Or, or city hall. Or city hall either, do they? You should try watching a parade in the dark. <laughs> Yeah, well, hopefully if we ever get the streetscape thing going, there'll be something taken care of. But at this point, I'd just like to ask that the, uh, the board approve the, uh, the additional lettering on the windows there for Tut's Restaurant. Okay. Julie, has anyone had a chance to review up for? I do have a question. Have we traditionally allowed signage on transom windows? Have we? Okay. We have. I, I, I do know at, at the John Bowling building okay. for, for McClure and McClure, I believe Great. there's transom and there's a couple other instances. Mm -hmm. don't, don't hold me to it real quick, but yes, we've done it. <laughs> I, just, I can't yeah. tell you where. The radio station has it. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. <clears throat> then I'll make a motion we approve it. I'll second. Have a motion, have a second. Any further discussion, questions, comments? Uh, Johnny did repair, prepare a staff report for that, so I don't know if you want to adopt that as well. Ooh. There's a staff report in your packet for the... My first one. Oh, there it is. Okay, I, I see, see it. it. Okay. So, I make a motion we adopt the staff report. Yeah. I'll second. Proper rules of order, does that... Does that it comes before the... It comes before, before yeah. yes. So the other one is tabled for the time being. On the motion to accept the staff report and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. It's a learning curve. It's new, onward and upward. We're, we're all learning, so don't feel yes. bad. Do you want me to restate my motion to approve the COA? I think that was tabled, I think. So, okay. so the Great. motion to approve, and we have a second to approve. Any further discussion? Questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. None opposed? Ms. Davis, thank you again Aye. for your work downtown. Oh, thanks, Tom. Very much appreciate it. If we could address just one more issue, it doesn't relate directly to her proposal, her COA, but also included is the interior LED or neon open signage. We let one open sign permitted per business per address. And so I wanted to confirm, is, your, is that business in two addresses? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right. Number four would be Mr. Stephen Dexter, who I don't think has had a chance to join us yet. Can we move on, if it's okay, Bridget, to the discussion? Yes, expansion? we just wanted to clarify, Johnny and I did, before we start the process, um, we have one request to um, expand the historic district with the Willis Russell House. And um, we have Maybe another one that's been brought up, but we've not really heard anything more back on that. We didn't know if you wanted us to work on another one or not, or whether to go ahead and proceed with setting up the public hearing and the process in, you know, in January to get this added to the district. Um, so is there anything else you all want us to look at before we start that process to include in the notice for the public hearing? Committee, anything? Okay. Well, we will go ahead and get that set up um, for January, so we'll be in touch with you as to what that process is, um, okay. hold that public hearing, and then go from there. They'll require the planning and zoning, and the city commission will have to be involved in it as well. Um, and we included that in your packet. Um, that's under section 4-176 in the, the historic district ordinance as to what the process will be. Um, Uh, no, it's okay. I mean, it's, I just wanted some feedback from you all as to what you wanted done and how you wanted us to handle that. So we'll go ahead and get those things set up to start the designation for the Willis Russell House. Bridget, I have a question. Yes. Is Willis Russell's on Walnut Street, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. If you look at the map in our packet, it's on page B1. Mm-hmm. What exactly are we, what is that little jut that's taking in the district there on East Walnut? 
Yeah, it doesn't go straight across. It, it comes out and... What, what are we including there in that little U? It, just the Willis Russell house is what we were looking at. I don't know, is there some, like I don't know what else is in that. In Appendix B, in the, on page 81, there is a little jet over to wall in the it, This map shows it's in there. Well, when, when I had the GIS do addresses for what this map goes to, it's not included in it. I mean, I... Do you see what I'm showing you there? Right. Right there. You're Am talking I about that right there? Yeah. Yeah, because it doesn't. It 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 looks like it's inside of that block instead of. I mean, the outer edges touch it, but it's not. It doesn't look like it's included in it. Hmm. Looks like it's into me, but okay. Next to it, that's in that we didn't include Willis Russell House. That's what I want to know. Well, there's a there's a White House, yeah. and then there's what, St. James. Right in yeah, I, I'm not sure if that's the property we're talking about. Would be that yeah. right there. Put my list yeah. I'm, I'm just curious what we put in, and we excluded Willis Russell when it's the oldest house on the block. I, don't I know. I we were we always thought it was in, but yeah. whenever I look back at the addresses and I look at this, it's like I it doesn't look like it's in the district. Just, it looks so, like just an error. So that's, okay. Um, I'm glad Bridget's confessing to that because I always thought it was yeah. in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Same with you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, thought I, it was I just in wonder also. if this map is just. Okay. We can do some more research on no, it no, before no. we start it. I think it. we just do the process and get it in for sure. Well, we definitely yeah. want it in. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> I don't think there's any contention about wanting no, it. No, it's just right. it's just a matter of going through the process. I don't think it's we can just certify it's just it should be a slam right. dunk, but yeah. it's yeah. we've actually officially got to do it to get it in. But since we were go doing it, I wanted to make sure there wasn't something else you wanted <coughs> us to look into. Um, uh, Bridget, if you'd like to move to number six, uh, um, discussion to certify the local government grants. Yes, uh, Joni and I will be working on what we currently have grants for, um, but also we need to look at, we have the application for the next year's grants. And so um, in January, we, we kind of want to get some feedback from you because in January, we're going to actually be getting something to you for approval so that we can submit it to the city commission in February at their 12th meeting. The grant application is due February 16th. So one thing that we're going to be doing is with this surveyor um, app that we're doing right now in this fiscal year's grant stuff, that's going to need to cross years. So one of the things that we're going to be applying for for one of the grants is the second phase of that. And um, Vic, the Heritage Council is working with us on doing that one. But we can submit multiple applications. So uh, I don't know if Nick wants to address an idea he had uh, for one, but we're looking. And I gave you a list of... Um, things that we can apply for, which is the grant priority list on there as to what we can apply for uh, items for that. So um, Nick, do you want to address what you thought would be one idea to be our second application? Nick Wade with Heart of Danville for anyone here that does not know me. Um, I had an idea of doing a window restoration workshop. Um, there are several property owners and homeowners in town um, that are interested and have expressed interest in a workshop. Mm -hmm. They want to take care of their windows, but they don't know where to begin. Um, and so they want to learn, so they have that knowledge that they can do it themselves um, for moving forward. And so it is a viable option for a CLG grant. Other communities have done it before. Cool. So, uh, as a question to, to staff, is that something we could uh, possibly get a boost up for continuing education for board members? Yes, it would apply. Mm -hmm. That would be wholeheartedly yeah. behind that. <laughs> that would be. And we could actually do this this summer. We wouldn't have to wait till next summer, would we? We would have to wait for the grant approval, which is usually in April, I think. Yeah. It okay. depends so on when all the documents do are done. Yeah. A lot of times, by the time we have the signatures and things yeah. like that, it's Good. June or July. Uh, great. I hate so. to make, I, my question was, we don't want to make them wait a year. Right. A year I, and a half. We could right. probably get it longer. Right. We, could, we could get it in when the weather is still nice, but right. it would may not be right this very, in the summer itself. Fall would be nice. It'll be cooler. Right. <laughs> <laughs> great idea. Are you going to write that? 
Yes. Fantastic. Great. Wow. Oh, wow. I think a motion that we approve that. <laughs> um, that with assistance, let me add. <laughs> yes. So that would be one idea we'd bring back along with the other topic that uh, Vicki has given us. Um, so if there's anything else we could think of that um, we might want to add into that. Um, and another thing we'll need to be working on in the new year is our goals for the next year. So we wondered maybe if you wanted to have a separate workshop meeting or if you want to include that as part of the regular meeting to um, approve whatever we need to approve for COAs, but also start looking at some kind of workshop session to uh, look at the next year. Um, and elections, I think we'll need, we'll need to have those in February, I believe, because um, we're supposed to have those annually. So we've got a lot of things on the agenda for the new year to get the ground running. So do you have any ideas of what you might want to do in January? <laughs> I would, if we can wrap the gold discussion into our regular meeting and just have a longer meeting, that would yeah. okay. be lovely. Mm -hmm. Be great. So put your thinking caps on over the holidays and be thinking about that because we'll be asking some of those questions um, for January. Could you do us a huge favor and email out maybe the past few years goals that we've, we've Well, had? that's kind of where we've not oh, always been so, so good about. <laughs> we we, we kind of sort of did, but yeah. Okay. yeah, we'll go back and send you back what we had last January, but that's something we need to really do a better job of and get going there. Um, the city attorney is on his way. So we might have to have a pause for a second, <laughs> unless there's anything else you all need to discuss. Or Joni, have I forgotten anything? I, I would like to say thanks. We have Mr. Horn from, from Planning and Zoning. Hunter. 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 <laughs> I say Horn. Hunter. And Ms. Kincaid from, from Arts Center. Thank you folks for, we're, we're tap dancing, Steve. Oh, sorry. Help. Help. You were waiting on you. It's your okay. turn. <laughs> we run a very. I'm happy to be here. This we time. run a very fast meeting. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. That's great. Very efficient. It is. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Uh, thank you all for having me here today to speak about the approval process for public art in the historic district. I think it is our first opportunity since the passage of your new historic design guidelines to talk about the process and the roles and responsibilities of various parties. Um, so we're just going to talk about process today. I'd like to answer any questions. I know you probably have several, some of which I've already been made aware of and hopefully I'll address in, in a discussion. I do want to tell you, please. Um, interrupt me at any time for a question. I, it, I'd much prefer to be interactive as opposed to me just kind of giving you uh, my synopsis, but, but I'm, I'm happy to do that as well. One of the major hopes of the new design guideline process when the grant was first received was to address how to deal with public art, uh, specifically murals which was an issue in the town and one which city staff and planning and zoning and really the community art center kind of struggled with how do we accomplish the goal of kind of covering some storefront windows that were vacant um, with something that was aesthetic and could not draw attention to something being empty. Our problem was we had no definition really of quote unquote public art or murals. So by default, it was painted. Um, it conveyed a message, some, albeit maybe just aesthetic and not commercial in nature, but there was some message conveyed. And by virtue of that, the only thing that it would fit into the definition of is a sign. So for lack of a better definition, that's the only thing it could be interpreted as, as the ordinances were written at that time. And we're talking about conversations probably as early as 2013 or maybe earlier. Um, it it's first arose probably when the Community Arts Center w was um, sponsoring the programs for 
the Kentucky Theater, old Kentucky Theater building to cover those those storefronts, and I don't remember ex exactly what the designs were. They've been a host of things. Um, the historic um, board wanted to support that idea, and planning and zoning didn't particularly have any issue with it. Staff was trying to, uh, they were coming to apply for a certificate of appropriateness, and the issue was, well, it doesn't really fit anywhere in our guidelines, so if it's a sign, it covers up too much of the window, it, uh, it's, it's too big, it's, um, you know, we have all these specific provisions on what signage can and can't do, and it didn't really meet them. So, as a matter of um, trying to find a way to support the project, I think city staff kind of took a back seat and said, well, we can't really approve it as a sign, but we're going to issue a certificate of appropriateness that's temporary in nature and set some, some guidelines for it to be passed, although there wasn't anything really um, solid to, to support that position, frankly. With, and we did so with the hopes of um, meeting with people in the art community and also AHB and planning and zoning to try to come up with, with a better way. We took several stabs at it, all of which were very complicated, burdensome. Then we found the grant, or Bridget, someone found the grant. <laughs> and to work with the um, people in Frankfurt and through, obviously you've been through that process, so you know. So we were thrilled, I was, and I know a host of people were to have design guidelines developed that actually address public art and murals um, in particular. So that's where we are today. So now we have some guidelines of what they should be and what may be appropriate under the design guidelines. To me, there are always general rules and then there are exceptions to the rule. There is classic um, statutory interpretation theory that says that the most specific ordinance, statute, rule, what have you, governs and takes precedent over the more general rule. I've been trying to think of a couple of instances to convey this to you um, easily. One came to mind this morning that's generally, let's say you are traveling on I-40 towards Asheville when you're in the, in the mountains and says speed limit 65 miles an hour. And then you notice in the far right lane it says trucks restricted to 45. Well, if you're a trucker, you better be going 45. The more specific rule governs your transportation, not the general 65 speed limit, saying there's an exception for trucks. You have to be in the right lane and you have to be going no more than 45 miles an hour. If you're going 50, it's a violation whereas a sedan next to you can go 65 and it's not a violation. We have exceptions to general rules all the time. The more specific provision prevails. That's a rule across the board, um, and that's a, just one of a host of examples we come up with. So, so using that um, analogy, we now have a rule that says in your historic guidelines that public art and murals should meet this these qualifications or guidelines. They are submitted to you under um, a request for a certificate of appropriateness, and you are the appointed board to um, vet those and see if they meet the design guidelines or not. You've been appointed to be that discretionary um, vote and, and review. The more general rule of signage no longer applies. We now have a specific definition for murals. It's no longer a sign. It is a mural. It does not require planning and zoning approval because planning and zoning only approves sign. Is it painted? Yes. Does it convey a message? Possibly. It's not a sign, though, because we now have a definition of a mural. So if the Community Arts Center or whatever organization is out there wants to paint um, or, or sponsor some type of painting of a mural on storefront windows, you you are the body who determines what is appropriate through the COA process based on your new design guidelines. Planning and zoning has no role in the process whatsoever. It's not a sign. Murals don't go to planning and zoning. Sign permits do. Okay, so that's, that's the first thing. Um, 
Sure. Uh, can you? Well, it's they're recording it, so we won't. Okay. Let me general, you gotta push it. I can do that right here, can I? Hey, Stephen. So, just to clarify. So, in your uh -huh. opinion, too, the zoning ordinance when we're talking about the stricter or two or conflict, we're design guidelines versus zoning ordinance. Inter those two aren't really what we're comparing, and it's the two sets of regulations in the design guidelines, the stricter or the two or the more. Sure, Definition. and that's in anything. But the zoning ordinance versus design guide, we're not, we don't look at it that way, nor would No, we. not in totality. Okay. I'm saying for this particular issue. We stick to the design guidelines. We stick to the design guidelines because the zoning ordinance doesn't have any type of definition right. for a mural. Okay. Now, ideally, we would have um, the planning and zoning ordinance, when revised, have some type of wording on murals or show some type of difference to a mural in the historic island. Let's say someone on um, in 4th Street wants to put some huge mural there on the side one. of the... There is one. There is one on the tattoo parlor. That, and that's the one that came to mind. Right. Yeah. So obviously that does not come to in the historic district, so it's not before this board, but planning and zoning may think it's appropriate to review or issue a permit on their end for murals and if the planning commission thinks that that is something that they should do then they can include it in their ordinance so then murals outside of the historic district could go to planning and zoning if they were to amend their their ordinance for, and right now for instance those murals under planning and zoning if it's outside of the historic district would be subject to their existing sign regulations because they have no other definition for them is ours different because it says specifically art versus advertising? It, art is not a sign. It says that. That's right. That right. And okay. that was one that, you know, past directors at the Community Arts Center have said, said well, it's, it's not, not a sign. A sign yeah. It's art. Yeah. And I can sit here and agree with you in theory, but the problem is we had no definition for it. So while we may agree it's art, the law we had said it was a sign. <laughs> That's my second And that's question. why it needed to be amended. Stephen, that's my second question, and I, everything you're saying I agree 100% with. Um, if an applicant files a COA as public art, clearly the design, design guidelines are very clear, art versus advertisement. Mm -hmm. What if it actually is advertisement? They've made an application for public art. How, how do we figure out that this one isn't public art? This one truly sure. is advertisement. Good question. Therefore, we use 622 and not the next how do and we figure that, that out? that is where um the board you would have to make that determination by saying this conveys a message that is commercial in it, nature it you is know, specific the, it is specific here on page 101 sure. that cannot include trademarks service marks other markings patterns or colors identifiable with a business so i think there's some starting points that's right and i agree right? and some i agree, I agree okay. wholeheartedly okay. and you know some things are so um there are commercial messages that are in things that look very artistic. They may not necessarily have a trademark on them, but you know, if you see the Santa Claus drinking a red bottle, an aluminum can, you know it's Coca-Cola. So, you know, some messages are so strictly tied to a commercial message that it, the line between art and logo is somewhat blurred, but I think tips into the uh, phase of being a a uh, commercial message. I would like, well, I feel like I'm the only one asking questions here. It does have a little bit of a clause here about incorporating the sponsor of a mural. So there, we do allow for, looks like a business name potentially to be in a mural. Did you see that? Yes, um, that did make it in there. <laughs> and that, again, when we, working with the community arts center on some of these projects would be sponsored by whatever business there may be. And so in, in order to give a, a nod to that, um, my take along the way was that it not be 
in a way that in looking at the total totality of the whatever artistic scheme is there that it becomes the primary message as opposed to um, just an ancillary notation. Yeah. We do something similar with um, banners that are hung on the front of City Hall. It used to be hung across Main Street right. um, that said they could only be for charitable, civic, educational, um, basically non-commercial ideas and events. However, we realize that sometimes those are sponsored by Pepsi or they're making the signs or whatever. So we came up with a way to um, restrict them to, I think we did so many maybe square inches or we had, we had some type of limitation on what that sponsorship could be. But yes, they can be a part of it. They just can't be the major part of it. <coughs> kind of like signing a picture, you know, like a drawing. You know, the, the sure. artist's name is in there, but it's down towards the bottom. That's right. Wall. That's right. That's okay. a good comparison. So are you saying that what the proportion of that uh, supporting message would be uh, in our discretion at this board? I think when you review these, you're going to have to make that determination if it's too large or if it takes away from the non-commercial commercial artistic message being conveyed. A lot of that is going to be discretionary, and that's why you're in your position to make that determination. Steve, another technical question. I, I know I'm just thinking out loud. The applicants of COAs, um, sponsors or property owners probably. I mean, like us, it should seem like the property owner would need to sure. make that application to clearly give all of us direction that they're okay with this thing going forward as opposed to a sponsor saying, hey, we're going to apply for this and there be some disconnect between Again, the tenant, renter, owner, mm -hmm. and who actually is requesting what. I would say as a general rule, the property owner should be the applicant. However, when there's a sponsorship of something on like a, a vacant building, mm -hmm. uh, generally the property owner is not going to be the one who wants to or is advocating for some mural be on their front. It's going to be some other type of probably nonprofit who's going to assert that interest. So in that case, in, in my mind, it should be a joint application both with the property owner and the sponsor. But the property owner does need to have um, some obligation to say, yes, I approve this, or I would want this to be on, and that that can be in a letter format, or it could be assigned on the application. I think what we'll do is just change our application to where we add a signature for the property owner, so that any application has to have the property owner's signature on that, which is... Sure, and that seems appropriate. And that way, that, that gives us, that we can put that language on there. Right. Uh, I will say, so, so far we've only had two real interested parties who are saying, this is, we have an idea, we've got the property owners, mm -hmm. go ahead, we'd love to do this. Um, and both the peop the, the their groups have, that have asked are fine, upstanding groups in this community that I do not doubt their intent or anything else. But I think it's very important for property owners to know that if somebody else is putting something on their property and that primary group fails to meet their long-term um, commitments such as upkeep, repainting, that it will fall to the property owner mm -hmm. to deal You're with right. it. And, and, and I need that from the code enforcement the side because otherwise I, I don't have anything to go after them to keep them in compliance. Right, and one, and critical to, we learned this early on in our conversation, critical to having any type of public art program or murals or things of that nature is some type of maintenance agreement or um, and a lot of that is in the design guidelines but one thing that I would prefer from an enforcement standpoint is that it actually be a, a condition a required condition on most of these that if they are going to be placed on the facade of a building a non-window facade where it can't be washed that it be on a surface that can be removed. So not on the structure itself, but on some type of structure that will actually be screwed in. That way, should the... Yes. Don't we get too complicated with the screwed in? But you're talking facade, right? 
I'm talking facade. Yes. Like, I, they have to be on the. Yeah. We don't. We don't allow anybody to do a big mural on the front of the. Has to be on the side or the back. Well, when I say facade, the facade is anything that's viewed from the street front. Oh, okay. So the proposal that's that's been in front of you is on the side of a building, but it's very much a facade. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. It's just not the front. I mean, if you don't have in a building adjacent, immediately adjacent to another building, the side is still very much the facade. Yeah. Yeah. And we have language in here for, for murals on a non-painted surface. There is a little thing here that we can, at our discretion, allow those, which I think is what we had sort of kept open we, we for what you're talking that. about, screwing yes. on. Sure. Big. And the thought is that in the, in the event that they become um, unmaintained, that they can be removed by code enforcement without any i don't think you want to have code enforcement officials uh, charged with going up and touching up signs right. <laughs> or and you certainly i mean the other only other alternative would be to simply have them paint the entire side of the building or facade whatever it may be which the city doesn't want to be in that position to do code enforcement doesn't want to be in that position it's much more manageable should it be on a surface that can be removed is that something that you could look into what the best practices are in other communities because this what i'm hearing you say though is that there shouldn't ever be a painted mural directly onto a wall which seems very unusual nationally well speaking. the design guidelines say it no the design guidelines i don't yeah and that's specific to paint. It doesn't differentiate between painted and unpainted. It says that overall the preference is that you attach it to the wall. Because I see the picture there. Yeah. Now it says here, locate murals on buildings that have historically been painted. Right. Which, but it seemed to me like what's, what I thought I heard Stephen saying was that even on a painted building, he would prefer that it be affixed to, an, an, to a freestanding thing, which that is not what the design guidelines are suggesting. Well, I think they do. I don't, they, the I don't have the, them in front the of me. The design guidelines say... Um, that they are encouraged. Yeah. The language is encouraged Courage. within that design guideline. You can't do them at all in the building. It's not painted. No, of course. You, you, and if you do attach them to right, the building, you they're have encouraged, to follow like, the guidelines to attaching them to that surface, yeah. right. which are also prescribed. Right. And then it specifically says on the other page, murals can be painted directly on a building or affixed to a substrate. And it mm -hmm. gives a really nice illustration of what the differences <laughs> would look like in sure. those occasions. And, and then the next sentence says, um, Sure, they're best on uninterrupted surfaces. And this is, I think, is this where we're getting back into that Installing question? Installing murals of on discretion? plywood is the most appropriate design choice left. Sure. So it, it's, it's preferred that they it be. It says if they have window openings, then it's best to do it on a plywood substrate. I think they're saying that's a better option. Right, it says for elevations that have window openings, installing murals on plywood is the most. Um, but see, for side elevations with no fenestrations, painting directly on the building when dealing with a historically painted surface provides an appropriate option. I didn't say it was inappropriate. I said I think it's a best practice from an so enforcement this is just standpoint. Where we get into that well, question of, of I think oh my God, are we, we talking about appropriate again? Board, just Please. for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> um, the way we read this, the way we put it out, the way we see it as written is bring us a perfectly reasonable proposal with a reasonable care structure from a group sure. that we have confidence in, most likely we're going to approve something to be painted on, 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 um, on a painted surface. But this of applying to other buildings, I mean, it does. It makes it easier for removal. Sure. Um, and in some cases, this, and this is where the discretionary comes down to, everything on these murals, I cannot begin to say how everything is going to be on an individual basis. Um, and very much related to which mm -hmm. building, where, how big, what kind of stuff. Oh, it's going to be a hoot. And it's also a nod to the fact that tastes may change. <laughs> and that what was, what someone viewed as appropriate or what you may view appropriate may not be appropriate in 10 or 15 years, depending on what historic, historical type of things change downtown. Um, so in a nod to what may change, and I'm thinking of this, for instance, when the building next to my law office, um, there was some old signage that was removed, and then there was that undiscovered mural that had a fresh face smoking. Um, had, and so now it's, it's somewhat hidden. I mean, you can see it from the sidewalk, mm -hmm. but it's somewhat hidden by the fact that there's a building right next to it. The, another advantage of having a 
painted removable surface is that if something has outlived its maybe significance, it could be removed and displayed somewhere. <laughs> Um, you know, it's kind of, we see some of these signs that become so decrepit over time and um, you can see kind of ghost images of them. But would it be historically pleasing to be able to remove them and actually preserve them somewhere? That might be a neat gesture. I don't know. But it's a possibility if it's on a removable surface as opposed to directly on, on the face. And, and Stephen, I think the point is we've written so much of this, <clears throat> ever how much we can write into the ordinance, but we're, tra we're treading down a whole new pathway here. You are. So a little bit of cautiousness to make sure we do it right, particularly initially, I think is warranted. I agree. Because we, we, can go, we can get way out in left field real quick and go, ooh, maybe this wasn't where we wanted to go. Right. So we have to be a bit careful, particularly initially, and that's... It's a learning process. It's it's new to this community. I had a question. Um, I haven't seen the design guidelines. Are there copies of those here? They're online. We online. don't have extra copies to hand out, but they are. They've been online since we approved them in October. But you can go to our Architectural Heritage Board website and you can see the, all of the guidelines. Okay. Uh, one of the questions, and it maybe it addresses that the Community Arts Center had applied for a grant a few years ago. I don't think they received the grant, but they wanted to ask if they could use the side of our building, which is adjacent to the Community Arts Center, to put a uh, electronically digitalized type picture, shined it onto the side of the facade, it would be a facade, of our building. Does the ordinance uh, address signs that are sh shining onto the side of a building like that? That's I'm an not, interesting I don't know what question. The, well, it was LED, LED art, yes. Yeah. So this has been discussed in other circles as well. And because, I mean, what, what I, you know, it's shining on, it's temporary. It would very much fall under temporary. It's not affecting the structure of the building. Right. And so I think it comes down to, is it distracting to people driving by? It would be much more of a, okay, how is this going to appear and for how long kind of discussion than, than what we are discussing, which is more very much physically altering the, yeah, the we're more concerned with protecting or or maintaining the integrity of the building. So just shining a light on the outside would be more or less outside of our purview. Yeah. It's like the people who've got the Christmas lights and the Santa Clauses shined yeah. on. Yeah. So then let me just address the white elephant in the room. Content. <laughs> um, there are so many things that I can see coming before us that content-wise we might not feel comfortable dealing with. But it sounds like you're saying that we have complete and utter discretion on this. You do. Okay. You are the appointed board by the commission to be the discretionary filter for these types of requests. So could we set up a committee that would be an advisory to us on mural content? You do not have the authority to do that. Who does? The commission could set up a could do that, but I'm doubtful that they will because they've appointed here's the thing, you are appointed to be that filter. So for you to request a committee is somewhat to shoulder your response or to push your responsibility off to another vetting wing. The commission has said, you know, they don't want this to be um, just with the Arts Commission or with the Community Arts Board or with any other host of art groups that are downtown. They want this to be of citizens that they have appointed for that specific purpose. So, so any role that any outside group or individual may have should be at your public hearing mm -hmm. to make their presentation to you of why they think it's appropriate or not. That is Fair. their chance to have a voice, Fair but enough. not through a committee okay. setup. So anything we approve that goes on a building falls back to the city for its responsibility as protecting our decisions. So we say yes. I can imagine any number of things coming before us that um, we say, yeah, sure, put that up, that's great, we approve it, and then somebody comes back and says, that is horrible, why would you ever do that? I'm offended. I'm offended, <laughs> and go to the city commission, and the city commission will say, our committee decided, you know, then they can, so they, the city commission is ready to back up our decisions or override them as they see necessary. Yes. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. I, can I also recommend that, since this, perhaps as you, sorry, 
perhaps as seats become available, um, that is maybe somebody who has knowledge in that area of murals and that kind of thing might be, you know, well suited to be somebody sitting up there. It very well, very well may be the case, and that would be obviously at the pleasure of the appointment of the mayor and uh, commission. I'll, I'll say this though too: the intention and the philosophy beside uh, behind. Uh, this this board is to have citizens that represent an array of interests, not just the art community, um, but rather a full um, array of various interests to come up with uh, the best collective decisions based on various backgrounds, tastes, influences, desires, and, whatever they may be. And as a point of reference, we at least have two members now that do come from that background. You have Melanie Quinn, who's an interior designer, and then Dana. That, that is an artist. And I have sure. 20 years art conservation. Yeah. So, sure. So, so, so the point is, right, I, right think, <laughs> I think the commission takes it very seriously who they appoint to this board and um, that because of their confidence in you, they feel like you are the best equipped individuals to make those decisions for our community. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Well, it's true. I mean, sure, I know they weigh these appointments very seriously. There is, under the certified local government requirements and our ordinance, too, requirements that two members have specific um, sure. education and requirements. So that has to weigh in as well when appointments are made, depending on who goes off. Then if that person is filling that role, then somebody's got to come back on that's going to fill that role. I'm going to make a general statement, I, and I very much appreciate what Stephen's saying from planning and zoning. Um, because I spent several years, actually, the staff of a board similar to this, uh, the Historic Preservation Board was under the umbrella of the Planning Commission. So we had Planning Commission, BOA, Historic, different architectural review boards that I staff personally. And what was great in the way we looked at this is what we just talked about with the map, that this is truly a historic overlay district under zoning. When we created the boundary of the historic district, it is in the zoning ordinance as referenced as a zoning layer, and it really supersedes kind of all the other base zoning. So it truly is an overlay. So I, I personally feel, and I think Stephen's uh, guidance here backs that up, that when this board makes a decision on a COA and says this is what we approve, whether it be for a mural or even a sign, I think it wouldn't be in the best community interest then for the Planning Commission to come back behind it and say, oh, but paragraph blah, blah, blah in the zoning ordinance says something different, and then we say no. I feel if this board says in their discretion this is an appropriate use of this building, that sign looks good, and I'm, I'm talking specifically about a sign, maybe it goes a little bit outside the bounds of the zoning ordinance. I don't think the Planning Commission then should come in and say denied. I think if this board approves a COA, then it's, it's almost a rubber stamp when that permit comes into us because this board's already used their discretion and their authority as that overlay to say this is what we're doing on that building, planning and zoning. That's how I've always done that in the past, that this board trumps kind of, I don't know if I want to use that word, <laughs> but that board that <laughs> sort of trumps the zoning ordinance. Takes because, precedence. Yeah, takes, takes precedence because uh, you guys have made a clear dis decision on, hey, that sign does work there, or in this case, it's a mural, it's not a sign. Planning Commission just steps back and says, that board made the decision and we move on. Um, you could even make an argument, maybe we shouldn't even have to issue a permit if someone had to make an application here to get a sign then to come back to our place and yeah. get another approval. Seems a little bit duplication, but I would think then we would look at your approval and say, if they approved it 32 and a half square foot, then we're done. Uh, and that makes sense to me, and that, and that follows the philosophy of an overlay district, truthfully. Um, so, Stephen, I agree with that, and I think that's a good way to move forward on signs, murals, or whatever you guys approve, then that falls back to our book. Does yeah. that sound right? Or It does. So, just to clarify for me, if it meets the requirements of a sign, though, it would fall under the requirements of this zoning Your, dis your flow chart is this. Someone that prepares a certificate of appropriateness, it's before you. If you look at it and you determine it's a mural, so question one, is it a mural or is it a sign? If it's a mural, it falls under your desired guidelines that we've just outlined in that section six. And then you make your decision, no planning and zoning involvement, period. 
if you look at it and say, you know, it, it's more of a sign. The message conveyed is more commercial in nature. It's a logo, whatever. This is not um, a, a mural. It is, in fact, a sign. Then you evaluate it as a sign, and it goes to planning and zoning for review as a sign. But you're going to vet what it is. So decision one is, what is it? If it's a mural, apply the guidelines, make your decision, use the discretionary that you've been granted. If it's not, consider it a sign, follow the appropriate uh, measures in your guidelines, send it on planning and zoning. And Stephen, where Bridget's going is there's a few little guidelines related specifically to signs in that don't gel district. with the zoning ordinance. That are That's in the historic right. district. So if they, if they use something in their design guidelines, for example, on the projecting sign or a pole sign or window graphics, and they say approved, and then our ordinance is still a little bit opposite, do you feel like we still defer to this approval? I do. Until we get, and the, the, the hope is we'll amend the zoning ordinance and get these all in line. It should be clarified. The historic practice is, though, if a sign passes muster from this board, then planning and zoning approves it. <laughs> this is a good day. Well, <laughs> let me also, let me clarify those. Just Stephen. to clarify. We one. always check with those, with the planning and zoning ordinance sure. before we bring them to this board. So we make sure they're going to meet your requirements, and that's how we advise the board. So just so you know, because you're not usually here, but right. But we, the most, if you if it's a sign, it needs to be in concert with the planning zoning ordinance and your historic guidelines. Mm -hmm. So staff is going to present that to you to show whether it's in compliance or not. Uh, Steve, I have a question. If it is not a sign, so it's something other than a sign, and this board approves it, is that the end of, end of it, or are you saying it also has to meet the city commissioner? That's no. the end of it. That's the end of it. That's the end. Okay. Yeah, That's it's only right. it's That's only right. if they deny a COA that then that kicks in the uh, next process, which would be an appeal to the city commission. Otherwise, it doesn't go to the city commission. It's, That's right. It's not part so of it's the kind of like damnable the planning zone if they recommend a zone change. If it's well, of course that still requires the city yeah. commission. No, it's not, like that it's not like that. Then the exactly. commission wouldn't even be notified. Period. If it's approved. That's right. Okay. And they wouldn't even be notified if it's denied unless an appeal is filed. Okay. Good discussion. Thank you. Does, yeah. no, I appreciate it. Everything has been clarified today that, yes. that I really wanted clarified. <laughs> Good. Good. Staff, any other questions? Did I answer your questions? I know you had a few. Did I answer them? Okay. Good. Okay. Yeah, and, that, and, that, and you've touched on that, and it's from our enforcement side, just making sure there is a, a definite maintenance plan that the property owner and the, whoever is sponsoring that signs so that we have something we can go back on. When we're trying to enforce that, I said one more. Note. I know I just can't shut up. Talking about the property owner, because of the city's inherent liability about someone painting a building without authorization, or maybe you've got to be sure that the property owner is indeed the property owner. Because you know, if you have a corporation that owns it, I mean, it's sometimes hard for me to find out who actually owns a piece of property. So that would need to be well, verified. Well, we, for, we as far as code enforcement goes, we usually go by what the PBA says as to who the property owner is. So we would check that as part of the staff report as we're going through. So when a COA comes in, we would be checking to see who the property owner is and making sure if it's for this kind of COA, a mural, then that the property owner has signed off on it and that they understand what they're signing off on. Um, and obviously we say if someone makes a statement or asserts that they're the owner of a building and they're in fact not, they get a COA, I would say in all cases that the certificate of purpose would be void on its face due to a fraud. So. You know, I know staff confirms ownership, but in the event that you had some unruly applicant, I would say it'd be void in the case that was, in fact, granted. <laughs> I don't know that that's ever occurred by chance, but <laughs> <laughs> we almost we'd, wish we'd never thought of it. We we tend to <laughs> know who owns. I mean, we could probably walk up and down Main Street right now, and all of us agree who owns <laughs> every building. Um, one of the benefits of our Small, Small town. town. Bridget, anything else? I, I don't have anything else as long as you all were okay on the discussion and okay because next meeting we will have a COA for you to review. Board, so, anything else? I make a motion we adjourn. I have a motion. 
And thank you, Stephen, for coming and clarifying. Thank you. And I'm sorry us. I slowed down the pace of your fast you, you your really rabbit didn't. You fast actually meeting. timed it. You timed it really good. <laughs> I, I do. I'm waiting on a second, but I do want to recognize and thank very much that our planning and zoning director and the Arts Center were represented today. Do we have any members of the city commission present? No. Thank you. I'm waiting on a second. Have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor of adjournment? Aye. Thank you all very much.